So diffusion is a tendency for um, <coughs> concentrations to get evened out. So if we have a large clump of some chemical here in air or water, some diffusive medium, something through which this can diffuse, we would expect that that clump would diffuse out and become uniform. So that's diffusion. There's a different type of system, though, called reaction diffusion, diffusion systems. And they're specified as follows. Let's imagine we have some diffusive medium, air, water, who knows, and now not one chemical or type of thing, but two types of things, A and B. And imagine A and B undergo some sort of reaction. And A and B are also still free to diffuse. So we could ask, well, what would we expect to see? Well, logically, um, given what we know about diffusion, diffusion tends to spread everything out. If we started with a bunch of A and a bunch of B in this medium, there might be some interaction, some things might happen, A could turn into B, B could turn into A, but if we came back five or ten minutes later or a day later, we would expect to see A and B and whatever A and B form together to be spread out across the system. Um, another way to think about that is if we have a system and we sprinkle in some A and we sprinkle in some B and we let it run, we would expect um, that a and B would remain mixed together, that it would be really weird if A somehow sort of separated itself out and there were regions of A and regions of B. But it turns out, as you can probably guess because the title of this unit is pattern formation, that there are certain types of reaction diffusion systems where um, exactly that does happen, where you can start with um, a more or less uh, homogeneous random mixture of A and B, whatever they are, and small fluctuations, maybe there's a little bit more A here, can get amplified and things can shift around and you can end up with stable spatial patterns even though you're in a diffusive medium. So this is a surprising result. It's not at all obvious, um, but it's interesting, I think, and again points to one of the lessons of dynamical systems, that simple dynamical systems can have surprisingly complicated outcomes. So let me now describe just a little bit some of the mathematics of these reaction diffusion systems and then in the next subunit we'll take a look at some computer experiments. So let's talk a little bit about the mathematics of a reaction diffusion system. Um, I'll use equations and introduce some terms. Um, you're not going to have to use this math directly but I, the equations are helpful partly just so I have something to point at when I talk, and also so you'll understand the program that we'll use to investigate these um, in the next subunit, and you might see these equations elsewhere. They're quite common. So in a reaction diffusion system, we now are keeping track of not one type of chemical, but two types of chemicals. As before, we have some spatial arrangement, um, x and y, and we want to know um, U of X and Y. That's a concentration of chemical A. How is chemical A spread out? So U, X, Y, you tell me the coordinates where I am here, and then U would give me the concentration of chemical A. But this time we also have another chemical, chemical B, and its concentration will be denoted by the letter V. Um, at least for me, U and V are dangerous letters to use because they if I'm writing quickly, they kind of turn into each other. But this U and V um, notation is pretty standard, so I'll stick with it and try not to have my U's start to look like V's. All right, so what are the equations that govern this? Well, both of these will diffuse. So they're described by a diffusion term. So remember, that looks like this. The partial derivative of U with respect to T, the rate of change of U, is going to be um, a delta squared u and similarly for v. So, so far this is just what we had before. There's no interaction or reaction between these two terms. <clears throat> this just describes 
um, the diffusion of chemical A, and this describes the diffusion of chemical B. And A and B are the diffusion constants, and they might be different. So they might diffuse at different rates. They might spread out through the surface one may be faster than the other. All right, but this isn't the end of the story. This would just be two things diffusing, not very exciting, but there could be a reaction between them. And generically, this is written like this. And these terms here would be reaction terms. So on the left, this is the rate of change of U. And this says it depends on this term, which says it's going to tend to spread out. And then this term, which says it's some additional function of U and V. So it could be that the more U there is, the faster this grows, but the presence of V inhibits the growth of U. So these could be terms that would look sort of like those interaction terms in the lotka volterra equations we studied a while back. I'll give a specific example of these for now. But before I do an example, I want to um, just talk a little bit about this as a dynamical system. So I guess mainly what I want to say is this is a dynamical system. A dynamical system is a rule for how something changes over time. Here the things we're keeping track of are u and v, but u and v are not single numbers. They're entire functions on a rectangle or a circle or whatever shape we're studying. So we would say that this is a spatially extended dynamical system in that what is evolving in time is not a single number for a population or two numbers for two different populations, but how the concentration over an entire area changes over time. So um, this dynamical system is deterministic. If you tell me the initial conditions, and in this case that means specifying the initial concentration of the U's and the chemical A and the initial concentration of B, um, given by this function V, and the value along this boundary, then that determines the future behavior of U and V everywhere in this. So it's a deterministic dynamical system just like before. The other point I want to make um, about sort of to characterize this dynamical system is that it's local. And let me explain what I mean by that. So suppose we're interested in the concentration of the chemical potential or the, excuse me, the concentration of chemical A at a particular point in space, this purple dot. So if we know what it is now, we can figure out what it is later. That's just like these differential equations we studied, ordinary differential equations, throughout the course. It's spatially extended in that we're describing a system that's spread out in space, but at this particular point, or any particular point for that matter, the future value depends on the amount of stuff that's here, the amount of U that's there, chemical A, the amount of B that's there, chemical V, which I haven't drawn on, and then um, this term here, which is a derivative, actually a second derivative, second spatial derivative of a particular type at this point. So it depends on what's going on at this point. The future, the, the next value, if you will, of U doesn't depend on what's going on let me say that again. The next value of u at this point does not depend on what's going on at some other point over here or over here. It depends only on what's going on at this point, on the current value of u, the current value of v, and the current spatial derivatives of u. As before, uh, del squared is the Laplacian. Let me just write this out for completeness's sake. So that's the second derivative of u with respect to x plus the second derivative of u with respect to y. And let me just write that this is deterministic. And local. 
So here we have a deterministic dynamical system. It's spatially extended, but the rule is local. And what we'll see is that this deterministic and local system, even though it has diffusion in it, is able to produce uh, stable spatial structures and patterns.